reach across the aisle, greet your brother in the wonderful name of Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. I'm, I'm going to ask you to participate, all of us together. We're here for, for one reason and one purpose, and that is to touch heaven. And what I want to do is I want to ask you not just in a whisper, not, not just in a little prayer, but I want us all to gather together and to touch heaven, to touch him through prayer. Would you do that with me? Could we pray over this service and ask the Lord just to come in and have his way there's nothing greater that we need than God to step in this place and do what he desires to do in our lives. Every one of us, every one of us has a need. Every one of us has something that we can't do for ourselves, that a doctor can't do, a lawyer can't do, that money can't do. Whatever that may be in your life, whatever it may be in someone else's life, would you reach toward heaven right now and pray with me? Heavenly Father, we call upon your holy name, God. We welcome you in this house, Lord. We reach to you, Lord. We press through the crowd of our mind, God. We press to you, Lord, reaching, God, searching for that, Lord, that you desire to do in us in this house, Lord. Come and let your spirit lead and guide this service, Lord. Have your hand, Lord, upon every soul, God, that's represented in this house, Lord. We ask you to walk through these aisles, Lord. Come like a flood into Bethlehem, Heavenly Father. Reign your spirit in this house, Lord. We need you. We need you. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for what we feel, Lord. Thank you for your presence, Lord. Oh, have your way, God. Have your way. I want, I want to encourage you tonight in worship. If, if there's one thing that I've learned, there's many times that I've stepped down here when really I didn't want to be around anybody. I didn't want somebody to come and talk to me. I, I didn't want to even leave my home, maybe even my room just because of circumstances or situations. And I'm sure many of y'all have been the same way. But I've come in and pressed to heaven in worship. And I found out that I can leave different than I came. I found out that He can alter your mind. He can alter the way that you feel. The circumstance doesn't even have to change. But I want to tell you, He can change you in the process of what He's doing. There's been many times I've left here and my children told me, you're different when we leave than when you came. And, and, and a shame because I want to be that way all the time. But the realization is that I live in this flesh. And I need Him every day, every hour of my life. And if we leave here and we leave unchanged, we're missing one of the greatest opportunities of our lives. We're missing what he's wanting to do for us. When he shows up and we feel that, it's just not just for a little feeling for you to go on and say that we came to church and, and I made it, but it's, it's to change us, it's to shape us, to mold us into what he wants us to be. I just want to encourage you tonight as we come together, let's come in one mind and one accord. There's got to be something in your life you're thankful for. There's got to be something that you're pressing for for him to do in the future. And I want to tell you, he, here, he is here tonight to meet that need.
Hallelujah, hallelujah. Won't you go ahead and praise the King of kings and the Lord of lords tonight. I said my God is worthy. I'm not ashamed of him, hallelujah. I said I'm not ashamed of this glorious gospel, hallelujah. It's what got me out of the mess that I was in, hallelujah. I'm not going to turn back. I'm not going to let go, hallelujah, but I'm going to keep on. I'm going to keep on praising my God, hallelujah. I said God is worthy of our praise tonight, hallelujah. Why don't you go ahead and give him a praise, not because I asked you to, but to give it, let it be the measure of how good he is and what he has done in your life tonight. Hallelujah. I said if he's ever delivered you, if he's ever brought you out of a trial, then why don't you go ahead and praise him. Hallelujah. If he's ever healed your body tonight, why don't you go ahead and praise him. Hey, hallelujah. Hallelujah. I feel something in the spirit here tonight. Hallelujah. We just about there. We just about there. On the day of Pentecost, they said they were all in one place and all in one accord. And the Bible said, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. You know what? We are just about to get there. And I don't want you to stop because I'm talking. I'll just get out of the way if that's what we're going to do. If we're going to praise him, I don't have to sit up here. Hey, I want to touch heaven tonight. What about you? Hey, I want something in my spirit tonight. Hey, like Brother Danny said, I don't want to leave the same way that I come. Hey, I don't want to leave the same way that I come. If I leave the same way that I come, I should have just stayed home. But I, we all done put on our pretty clothes, got our hair done right. We might as well go ahead and worship the Lord tonight. Praise God. Ain't there a good spirit in this house tonight? Praise God. Hey, somebody can get delivered in here tonight. Hey, somebody can get the Holy Ghost in this place. That's what it's all about. That's why we gather here. To, we gather here for somebody to receive the Holy Ghost. I gather here to get a touch every time I walk into these doors. Praise God. Praise God. You know, that's the thing about the Holy Ghost. It's not a one-time thing. You know, sometimes I hear we, we relate it to gas in our car. It'd be nice if we could just put gas in our car one time, and that'd be it. But it's not that way. We have to put gas in our car depending on how far you drive. Depends on what you're walking through in this life and how much Holy Ghost you need to get. We need to, I need to get a touch every day. You know, here lately it seems like I've just been walking. My load's been getting heavy. I just need a touch every day. Every time these church doors are open, I at least need to get it in. Praise God. You know what? If we, get our, if we get our tanks full of the Holy Ghost, then we don't have to worry about sin. We don't have to worry about the enemy. Because the Bible said that God has placed him under our feet. Hey, he has, there is no hold on Satan. There's no hold that Satan has on us, excuse me, that we can't overcome as long as we have the Lord Jesus Christ in our life tonight. Why don't you give, give him a praise one more time tonight? Praise God. Praise God. He's been good to me. If he don't ever do another thing for me, I'd like to say that I'd go ahead and serve him anyway because he's already been good enough. Praise God. If our ushers will be making their way, getting ready to help us this evening, we'll, serve, we'll uh, go ahead and take up our Sunday evening offering. I don't know about you. How many, how many folks uh, ran and walked in this 5K yesterday? <laughs> hey, I think every hour I'm feeling it more and more. Yeah, man. Whew. But I had a good time. Everybody, I, we just appreciate everybody coming out yesterday and supporting. We had a good time in, in fellowship and uh, even had a better time right after that 5K was over. But we had some good food. We appreciate everybody coming out. Uh, also tonight, I'd like to make, uh, make mention that the youth are having a fundraiser tonight directly back in the uh, old dining hall tonight, uh, straight back to your left in the prayer room. I believe it'll be $6 a plate spaghetti dinner tonight. Uh, I believe that comes with a salad, a dessert, and your choice of tea or water. So we want to we wanna support our young people. I believe uh, it's for National Youth Convention this year, and uh, National Youth Convention, I believe, is in Indianapolis, Indiana. Am I right? Indianapolis, Indiana. So that's a good way. We need to support our youth. You know, I, my kids, are, their children, they're, they're getting on up, and, you know, I, I would rather them be doing things like going to National Youth Convention than the things that I got caught up in when I was young. And you know what? I don't want to let something like money interfere with my kids being able to go and get some Jesus in them. Because you know what? Even more so than back when I was alive today, these, these young people are going through all kind of things. And you know what? There's things that are pulling for their minds. And if, and if we don't reach them, if God don't reach them with this glorious gospel, we don't give them an opportunity to present that, to be around godly people 
and the church, then this world is going to reach them. And I refuse to let our youth be reached by this world when I can help them go to National Youth Commission. How about you? How, how many of you are going to go support this evening in the dining hall immediately following church tonight? Praise God. Also, make another mention about our men's trip coming up next month. Uh, if, if, if you are uh, wanting to go, uh, obviously, you, you need to get with the, the proper channels, and we can get you ready to go participate in some of these fundraisers. I believe it's coming up Friday night. There's going to be a, a fish plate supper. So if you are interested in that, you can see several of the people uh, tonight that are selling these fish plates. I'm not sure exactly how much they are, but you can, you can buy yours tonight. How many of you are ready to, to hear the word tonight? I'm ready. I'm anxious to hear the word. Didn't we hear a good word this morning? Praise God. We heard a good word this morning. We're getting ready to, to receive our offering this evening. Uh, I didn't get any prayer requests, but we're going to go ahead and pray anyway. I, I'm convinced that uh, a church this size, there are needs across this place tonight. I know I have some unspoken requests. And if you have a need tonight, why don't you go ahead and lift your hands toward heaven? You know, we serve a God that knows our needs. And he's able to meet those needs. And we don't even have to make those niches. Those, those needs mentioned, he already knows. So we can go ahead and call on the Lord tonight. Dear Heavenly Father, we love you tonight. We're thankful for healing many times, God. God, we pray tonight, God, that you would touch these needs across this house, God. There are people here that are struggling financially. There are people that are hurting in their body. There are people that, that the devil has been on their case, God. And we pray, God, tonight that you will bring strength, God, deliverance in those situations, God. And I pray tonight, God, that you will bless tonight the offering that has been brought before you tonight, God. This is an opportunity for us to give back to you, God, for everything that you give to us is, is just a gift, and we want to give to you tonight out of our heart. God, we pray tonight you would bless the hand of the giver, and we know that when, we, when you do, God, you're going to bless us good measure, pressed down and shaken together and running over. In the name of Jesus tonight, amen. If you will tonight, won't you let the ushers lead you, and uh, you just come give your offering with a smile.
set that fire in our soul, Lord Jesus. God, make us fresh. Make us brand new, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Lord, we praise you, Jesus. It's all going to be worth it one day. Hallelujah. When we see the face of Jesus. Glory to you.
But the words of this song, we shall behold the Lamb of God. He'll be sitting on the throne. There'll be no more crying. All these trials and tribulations and heartbreaks and the crushing and the depression, they're not going to exist anymore. We're going to be walking on streets of gold. My dad will not limp. He will walk on brand new feet, brand new bones. Sister Johnny Sue, you won't have to have that wheelchair. Because when you get to heaven, it's all going to be gone. We're going to bask in the glory of God. And we're just going to stay in his presence. I'm so thankful that any day now, the Lord is coming back and he's going to take us away. I praise him tonight, God. Y'all just worship. Worship the Lord. One more time while we sing this. Oh. tonight oh I'm looking for the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ who deserves my praise right now oh thank you Jesus that's right go ahead and worship the Lord together magnify his name glorify his name exalt his name oh that's right praise him hallelujah hallelujah Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. God bless you. You can be seated. So good to see all of you in the house of the Lord tonight. What a wonderful presence of the Holy Ghost is in this place. Such a rich, rich move of the Spirit. And I'm so thankful for the goodness and the grace of God. I'm so glad I can feel the Holy Ghost in this place tonight. Amen. Amen. I'm proud of our young folks. Did you see all those young folks up here leading? Amen. Had a, had a, a, a new bass player tonight. And had Gracie on the keyboard and these three young people leading that first song. I met with our music team on Wednesday night. And uh, back several months ago uh, when, when, uh, when I found out that Brother Evan and Sister Ashley were going to be leaving us. It was back, I think, towards the end of March, and we began to pray and ask the Lord for His will, and, and I began to seek God for direction, and uh, it seemed like every avenue that we went down, it just, the, the Lord put a, put a roadblock there one way or the other, and, uh, and, and through all that, I felt like the Lord dealt with my heart in a very strong way, and that is that our church must go from a consumer to a producer that instead of importing we need to be exporting which means we need to raise up generations of people that know how to work in the kingdom of God amen amen 
And I, and I met with our music team Wednesday night while Brother Jacob was preaching. And I told them what I felt on my heart. And, and I think that, that, that pretty much shoulder to shoulder, every one of them felt like that we were in the will of God. And we are making a concerted effort to involve our young people and children more and more. Our people who have talent, our musicians, are, all, are offering themselves to help our children and young people learn how to play music. We're going to get them more involved. We're going to get them out front. And didn't they, that, that did tonight, didn't they do a great job? Man, I'm proud of them. Hallelujah. So proud of our children and our young people. And, uh, and, and we are raising generations of young people that are going to be active in the kingdom of God. And, uh, and, and not only that, but that same, that same mentality, we have... We have these, all these folks are doing such a good job helping us with our music. I appreciate them. I mentioned this morning how hard they work. We have a lot of good ministers, men of God that are in our church, and we're getting them more involved and using them because God has put us all together. We are a building fitly framed together, a body that every part and every joint supplies. And I'm excited about what God's doing. I'm excited about what the Lord's going to do. I'm excited about what He is doing. And I certainly hope that not just our young people, but there's people with talent on these pews that need to be involved. And uh, there's men that need to be involved. There's women. And there's more young people. So we're excited about what God is doing and thankful for that. Remember the fundraiser after service tonight. Also remember the, uh, the fish fry. If you'll buy your tickets, we really need you to support. If you can help us sell some tickets, uh, get with the folks at the desk back at the table back there uh, after service. We, we need a good event on Friday night from 5 to 7 for this fish fry. And, uh, and it's going to be a good, good time. Sister Johnny Sue, it's so good to see you able to be in the house of the Lord tonight. Amen. Amen. It's good to see the Melton family with us again tonight. And, uh, and all of you, why don't you stand and give, give all of our guests a good welcome to the house of the Lord. All of our guests that are here, thank you so much for coming. I'm glad I'm in an apostolic church where we still preach and teach the apostles' doctrine. Repentance, water baptism in Jesus' name. The infilling of the Holy Ghost, which is still the way to be born again. And the greatest experience that you'll ever have. The book of Galatians chapter number 6. Galatians chapter number 6. And verse number 7. Galatians 6 and verse number 7. The word of the Lord says, be not deceived. God is not mocked for whatsoever a man soweth that shall he also reap whatsoever a man soweth that shall he also reap that is the law of sowing and reaping. What you sow, you will reap. I might mention that you usually reap in a different season than you sowed in. So don't be weary in well-doing because you'll reap if you faint not. And I also might mention that you normally sow much more than you reap. Otherwise, every farmer would be out of business. So that, that, that's a good or a bad, depending on how you're sowing. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Preach a message tonight. I'm going to preach a message tonight from a scientific principle titled The Butterfly Effect. The Butterfly Effect. Effect. Whatsoever a man soweth, look at somebody and tell them you reap what you sow. Look at, look at him again, point at him, and tell him you reap 
what you sow. Lord, I thank you for your people and your church. Oh, God, I feel the Holy Ghost in this place right now. I feel an unction to preach. God, I think, I feel, I feel an expectancy in the Holy Ghost that you're going to do something great through this congregation and through this ministry. In the name of Jesus, I pray that you would help me to preach what I feel you've laid on my heart. Anoint our ears to hear, oh God. Lord, I pray for your divine blessing upon each and every one of us as we seek your will. God, help us to sow in the Spirit. In the name of Jesus. And the church said amen. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise as you're being seated. Amen. Give. The law of sowing and reaping. Think about this. A typical ear of corn contains 800 seeds. Each seed grows a stalk. On each stalk, there are typically two ears of corn. That means that each stalk, on average, would have about 1,600 seeds. So you got one ear of corn, you get 800 seeds. Each of those seeds planted grows a stalk that has two ears. And those two ears each have 800 seeds. So if you plant one corn seed, one corn kernel, and you tend it for a season, when the harvest comes, you then have 1,600 seeds. If you were to plant those in the next planting season, and you plant those 1,600 seeds, and they yield each of them a stalk with two ears. At the end of the next season, you would have 2,560,000 more seeds. So what you reap, what you sow, you reap, but you reap much more than you sow. Amen. One seed planted in spring, cared for in summer, brings a harvest multiplied times larger than the work that was originally planted. A little seed, a little seed brings in a large harvest. And that one little seed planted and sown and harvested after years could feed entire communities because one little seed, one little kernel of corn, one little seed seems insignificant. One little seed seems unimportant. What value is one seed when you have a world to feed? What value is one seed when you have a family, a neighborhood, or a community to take care of, but one little seed planted, watered, cared for, waited for, and harvested becomes a larger harvest, and a larger harvest, and a larger harvest. One seed, one kernel of corn seems insignificant, but if you were starting a new society in a new land, one of the most valuable things that experts say you could ever have with you would be seed because a seed ensures a harvest. The value of the seed is recognized by the scientific community. I read that in the far reaches of Norway, scientists have built what is called the Global Seed Bank. That in the event of a massive catastrophic event, where the population and the crops were compromised, the seed bank, the global seed bank, would be able to provide seed to sustain whatever life would remain because they understand the principle of a seed sowing and reaping. One little seed today 
can change the world tomorrow. I read a story, I read a story recently about a, uh, a landowner in Missouri right after the Civil War. This landowner was against slavery. He had on his, on his farm working for wages a woman whose husband had been killed in a raid. This woman had a little baby boy, 16-month-old little baby, and this that there was a group of, of Civil War soldiers who were raiding Quantrill's raiders who raided in areas in Kansas and Missouri. They heard about this farmer who had opposed slavery, so they raided his farm. They killed all the livestock except for one horse. They killed most of the workers except for this woman. This woman they took off into captivity. She refused to let go of her little baby boy. She held that little boy tight in her arms. So when they took her captive, they took the little boy as well, and they rode off into the night. Then the word was passed by the landowner to the farms around. He wanted to have a meeting with Quantrill's raiders. So they met at a crossroads in Kansas. These four men who were sent by the raiders carried in their on their, on their horse, on their pack, a burlap sack. When a trade was made, they traded, this farmer traded his very last horse for that burlap sack. And that burlap sack was thrown to the ground. And in that sack was that 16-month-old little boy whose parents had been killed, whose, whose mother had been killed. The man, it was wintertime, he opens the sack and he sees the little baby boy has no clothes on and he's nearly dead from freezing. The man opens his coat, puts that little baby inside of his coat, and he warms him while he walks miles and miles and miles back into Missouri and back to his farm. They take this baby. They nourish this baby. This baby's name was George Washington. And by saving him, he adopted that family's name of Carver. And this baby was George Washington Carver. George Washington Carver, while going to Iowa State University, became friends with the chancellor of the university. The chancellor liked this young man so much that he would send his little boy with George Washington Carver out into the fields. This man's name was Wallace. His son's name was Henry. Henry Wallace was a little boy that fell in love with, with horticulture and plants and botany. And this little boy fell in love with the idea of seeds and the idea of harvest. George Washington Carver went on to invent hundreds of items that we use now simply out of peanuts. And he invented them from peanuts and from sweet potatoes. And we use hundreds of the things he discovered still today. This little boy, Henry Wallace, grew up to become the vice president of the United States of America. Henry Wallace, while serving as vice president under Franklin Roosevelt in Roosevelt's second term, he started a seed situation in southeastern United States. He started a school, and that school's job was to develop a seed that could grow in a desert. They were to try to develop some kind of a plant that could live in a dry, arid region. So that seed that was invented through the man, the man that invented it was a man by the name of Borgland. Borgland invented the seed. Borgland won a Nobel Prize for his invention because at that time his seed had been transported all over the world to desert lands, to countries where there was no harvest, and it was estimated that Borgland's seed hybrid had already at that point saved over 2 billion lives in its history. The value of a seed, a seed developed in a laboratory in the southeastern United States, travels the world and saves over 2 billion lives. How insignificant is one seed? Well, I'll tell you this much. 
I know one seed is enough to spawn an agricultural revolution that saves billions of lives. Amen. I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm going somewhere here tonight. One seed can change the world. One seed today can change the world tomorrow. We see in biblical history moments when decisions and actions that seem small or relatively inconsequential have far-reaching and devastating even impact. The most evident perhaps is the life of Abraham. God promised Abraham a seed through his wife Sarah that through Abraham and Sarah there would be a seed raised up and from that seed would come a Messiah and that Messiah would bring salvation. That was God's promise to Abraham and Sarah. But Abraham begins to grow old. Sarah begins to grow old. And she begins to doubt that God can fulfill his promise. So Genesis 16, 1 and 2 said, Now Sarah, Abraham's wife, bare him no children. And she had a handmaid, an Egyptian, whose name was Hagar. And Sarah said to Abraham, Behold now, the Lord hath restrained me from bearing. I pray thee, go in unto my maid. It may be that I may obtain children by her. And Abraham hearkened to the voice of Sarah. Sarah said, Abraham, I'm old. I'm not going to be able to raise up a child. God has decided that I'm not going to have a baby. So take this Egyptian slave girl and we'll count her children as my children. That is about as silly of a decision that could be made. That one woman, how silly could it be for a woman to think that God can't keep his promises? But this woman, this woman makes a silly decision. Now, now think with me for a second. There's been billions of women born in the history of the world. Billions. Everybody say billions. There's been billions of women that have lived since the dawn of time. There have been billions of babies born in history. What possible difference could one couple's bad decision make have to do with world history? I'll tell you, this woman named Hagar and Abraham have a child. They named the child Ishmael. I could make a logical argument tonight that Ishmael is the second most important person born in the history of the world. Well, who to be the most important? I heard it, Jesus, right. But Ishmael, the child born to a woman that had a bad idea, how, how big of a difference could one baby make? How big of a difference could one bad decision make? How insignificant is it for one bad decision, one child, but from this union of Sarah's slave Hagar and Abraham comes Ishmael. From Ishmael, there are now 450 million Arabs in the world. From this one child comes all of the Muslim nations of the world. From this one child, the descendants of this one child have been constantly at war with God's people. From the Ishmaelites who bought Joseph out of the pit to the Philistines that fought wars after war after war. Tell me what difference could one decision make? Ask a little Israeli girl who right now is sleeping in a bunker because they're lobbing missiles over the border right now and she's sleeping in a bomb shelter because of one bad decision made 4,100 years ago. What difference could one bad decision make? Ask a mother who has to visit the grave of her American soldier son who died searching for Saddam Hussein or Osama bin Laden. What difference could one decision make? By one woman make, ask the families that gather at Ground Zero every September 11th to ring the bell to, warn, to mourn the passing 
of their loved one. One moment, one decision, 4,100 years ago has led to untold millions of deaths and destruction on the world today because of one moment, one decision. You with me still? Think about Saul, the first king of Israel. He's given a specific commandment from the Lord. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I remember that which Amalek did to Israel, how he laid wait for him in the way when he came up from Egypt. Now, he's talking to, the Lord's talking to Saul, now go and smite Amalek, utterly destroy all that they have, spare them not, slay both man, woman, infant, suckling, oxen, and sheep, camel, and ass. Go destroy all of them because God knows that the Amalekites are always, always, always going to be an enemy to God's people. He knows that the Amalekites are always going to be at war with God's people. So the commandment came, you've got to destroy what's trying to destroy you. You've got to do away with what's trying to do away with you. Saul almost does what God says. Somehow, somehow, he forms the thought in his mind that if I kill all of them, but I save Agag, their king, somehow, That'll be enough, because after all, what difference can one man make? What difference can one man make? What possible difference? I mean, look, we've destroyed all the Amalekites. We've destroyed them all. What possible harm could come from leaving one man alive? So he spares Agag, the king. The Bible said he took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive. And he spared Agag and the best of the sheep and of the oxen, the fatlings, and so on and so forth. What difference could it mean to save one man when God said destroy him? But before the sun went down that day, God said, I have rejected you from being the king. And Samuel had rent the kingdom from the hand of Saul. He lost his position. He ends up in witchcraft. And more than anything else, he dies at the end of Amalekite's sword. What he left alive destroyed him. So, what difference does it make? Well, when that sword is piercing your, your, your guts and you're dying there on a battlefield, then you'll understand what difference it made. When you saved Agag way back then and you kept the Amalekite race alive, you know that that's the reason why you're now bleeding to death on a battlefield but let's fast forward it generations later there is a man by the name of Mordecai he has a niece by the name of Esther who is the queen and here they are they're waiting and there's an evil man that now has tricked the king into passing a law the man's name is Haman Haman the Bible said that he has a lineage the Bible said his name is Haman the Agagite Because what you leave alive will come after you. What you let live in the Spirit will still be after you a long time down the road. That's why you need to get your life in order tonight and not let sin reign in your body. Because if you let it live, someday it's going to get you. It's going to destroy you. So what difference does it make? Well, you tell me while Mordecai looks out and gallows are being built because a law has been passed and without divine intervention, the Jews would have been destroyed that day because one man made one bad decision to spare the enemy. unwittingly unleashed a monster that without divine protection would have eradicated his offspring. But God worked a miracle. What difference? What difference does one bad decision make? In 1963, a scientist named Edward Lawrence presented a hypothesis to the New York Academy of Science. His theory stated simply that a butterfly could flap its wings and set molecules of air in motion, which would maneuver other molecules of air, in turn moving more molecules of air that eventually could start or cause a hurricane on the other side of the planet. Get that? 
that a butterfly flapping its wings here could move a, a little bit of air and that air move more air and more air that by the time a chain and sequence of events came in place could cause a hurricane on the other side of the earth. It's called the butterfly effect. I brought the book just so you wouldn't think I was making it up. Those in attendance that day at the New York Academy of Science literally laughed Lawrence out of the conference. They mocked him and ridiculed him until he completely left the building. They felt that what he proposed was so ridiculous and preposterous. Who ever heard of a butterfly flapping its wings here, starting a storm over there? So they called it mockingly the butterfly effect. For the next 30 years, it was the, the, the butterfly effect was relegated to science fiction books and bad movies until a group of scientists and colleagues from colleges and universities around the world 30 years later came to the conclusion that the butterfly effect was actually authentic, accurate, and viable. And they changed it from calling it the butterfly effect to now it is an established scientific law that is called the law of sensitive dependence upon initial conditions. I bit my tongue saying it. The law of sensitive, sensitive dependence upon initial conditions, which being interpreted is the butterfly effect. The law is simple. Something small done today can radically impact something in the future down the line. It's part of what's known as chaos theory. They have scientific theories that work in, in ways that establish how electricity works and how this works and how, how gravity works and how this works and that works. But then there's this whole list of things that they can't account for because there's no linear way that it doesn't move in a linear line that if this happens, this happens, this happens. So it's a set of random conditions that if, if, not properly, if not properly followed, anything could happen. All right? You still with me? Good, good. So he starts by saying that something small happening now can change everything in the future. That if a butterfly flapped its wings in Brazil and started a minuscule air current, undetectable by human senses that that microscopic movement of air could ripple out and catch momentum that by the time it reached Texas could be a tornado. If one woman, now, now listen, I hope you're paying attention because I'm trying to bring this down now. If one woman could make a decision 4,100 years ago that is still sending ripples through the world politics and finances, and armies, and warfare today. If one woman making a bad decision 4,100 years ago could still be a dynamic that shapes the politics of the world today, I've come to submit to you tonight that if that can happen on the negative side, then inside of these walls are the, is the potential to initiate something that will change the world to a positive effect. Oh, I'm talking about the butterfly effect. You may say what could happen here in the country, what could possibly happen here tonight that could change the world. You may be tempted to say, who am I that I could do anything tonight that would change the world? But don't forget that Moses in the desert said, God, who am I that I should go before Pharaoh? David said in a valley four times, Who am I, Lord, that you would use me? And Solomon said, Who am I that I could build a temple for the Lord? Most great things that have ever been done for God started with somebody that said, Who am I? What could I possibly do? What could I possibly change? I'm not worthy. I don't have the skills. I don't have the ability. But they acted in the way that God told them. Even though they felt insignificant, 
they acted uh, thinking they had no ability, but they acted uh, and their action started something uh, that is preached about today. It started with a who am I? So if you're sitting here tonight and you're wondering, well, who am I that I could do anything for God? I'm just a churchgoer. I'm just a young person. I'm just an average everyday person. You are exactly the kind of person that can start something now that can have far-reaching effects into the future. Little things can make a difference. One prayer can change a nation. In the early 1930s, a spiritual butterfly flapped its wings. Someone whose name, as far as I can tell, is lost to history. Witnessed to a man. That man was filled with the Holy Ghost. In 1933, the butterfly flapped its wings again, if you will. And in 1933, that man who got the Holy Ghost a little earlier witnessed to another man. And this other man went to a revival and was filled with the Holy Ghost. But it's just one man. What difference can it make? But the butterfly flapped its wings again. That second man witnessed to his niece, Irene, and her husband, Beckham. Irene and Beckham got the Holy Ghost. And then the butterfly flapped its wings again. And Beckham, every weekend, walked and hitchhiked 20 miles every weekend to tell his mothers, to tell his mother, his brothers, and his sisters about the Holy Ghost. And then on June the 18th of 1933, the butterfly flapped its wings again. And in a creek on Cedar Grove Road in Raleigh, Tennessee, Beckham's brother, Frank, was baptized in Jesus' name. But what difference could a 19-year-old boy being baptized in an obscure creek in Tennessee make? Well, Frank went to the barn, and Frank began to pray for the Holy Ghost. And in a barn, God filled Frank with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. He left the barn to walk home, and while walking home, he said he heard a voice of the devil say, you didn't get the Holy Ghost. So he goes back to the barn, and he prays through and talks in tongues again, and he leaves to go back home, and he hears that voice of the devil say, you didn't really get the Holy Ghost. So he goes back to the barn again, and he prays until he's filled with the Holy Ghost again. And while he's walking back, he hears the devil say, you didn't get the Holy Ghost. So he tells the devil, you told me I couldn't get the Holy Ghost. Then when I got the Holy Ghost, you told me I didn't have the Holy Ghost. He said, shut up, devil. I have the Holy Ghost. That butterfly flapped its wings again. And Frank won his mother and his sister and his other brother. And 20 year, at 20 years old, he was called into the ministry. And 20-year-old Frank's picture hangs in the vestibule of this church. as We know him as Brother J. Frank Wilson. But it happened because an unnamed man witnessed to another man who witnessed to Beckham. They didn't know that the butterfly... They didn't know the butterfly back way back in the, by the creek in, in Tennessee was flapping its wings. But something started way back then that here we are today in a house of God built by a man of God because a butterfly. Oh, don't tell me that little events don't make big differences. Don't tell me that little things don't change everything. Because if you were to ask, we don't even know the person that got it started. We don't even know the name of the person that witnessed to the man, that witnessed to Beckham and Irene, who witnessed to Frank, who got baptized and filled with the Holy Ghost and moved to Mississippi and, and, and took over this church and built it from almost nothing into what we have today. It was just a flap of a butterfly wing as far as the rest of the world was concerned. Nobody knew. Presidents didn't take notice that a man was being witnessed to. Nobody knew about that. The, the press never came out and wrote newspaper stories about it. Nobody came out and took pictures. But in a creek, in a, on a side road in Raleigh, Tennessee, a man was filled with the Holy Ghost, and the effects are still being felt. It
it's the butterfly effect. It happened. It happened in 1933. But here we are today still talking about it. Because even though it was small back then, look at what it's turned into by the hand and the grace of God. I'm preaching right now about the butterfly effect. That's something small. Oh, God, help me. God, help me right now. What happens tonight, as far as the world may be concerned, may be as small as the flapping of butterfly wings. But by the time it plays out, it could be a movement that radically changes our community, our area, our nation. But we got to start somewhere. I said we got to start somewhere. Oh, Lord. I'm, I'm hurrying a little bit. Today, we, we support hundreds of churches in the nation of Chile under the care of our friend, Bishop Nacho Fuentes. Bishop Fuentes' father, many years ago, was walking down the street and was stopped by an American preacher named Brother Parent. This chance meeting on a street was the current of butterfly wings, if you will, that has sparked what many have called the most successful apostolic mission work in the world. It started on a Santiago street with what seems to be nothing more than the flap of a butterfly wing, imperceptible to the Chilean government, imperceptible to the world, but it started a movement that is turning the nation of Chile upside down, and it's reaching throughout entire South America. It was several years ago in a Starbucks coffee shop in the metro Detroit area that a couple, a, a couple going to get a cup of coffee before church saw a black man reading a Bible while drinking a cup of coffee in the Starbucks restaurant. They introduced themselves to him. It turns out they find out eventually that he was a Pentecostal Trinitarian bishop from the nation of Uganda who was over literally thousands of churches and many orphanages. This, th this couple did a Bible study with this man. They did this Bible study with this man that they just happened to stop by his table in a Starbucks. Think about all the random events that had to happen for them to be there at the same time. Think of all the events that had to happen for him to come from Uganda and be sitting there when these apostolic people walked into the Starbucks and saw him sitting there and began to do a Bible study with him. They taught him a Bible study. They opened the Word of God, and they began to teach him about baptism in Jesus' name. Finally, finally, this man, his name is John Wayaberry. Bishop Wayaberry, he, he shakes his head. He says, I must be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. He goes to the church in Auburn Hills, and he gets baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. He sends in his card for the organization that he was in. And he joins the assemblies of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is turning his back. He don't know if he's going to get support, but the money is now cut off from that other group. But he knows, I've got to be baptized in Jesus' name, and I've got to go home, and I've got to preach it. And he goes home, and he calls all the pastors from their churches all across Uganda, and he calls them in, and he begins to teach them Jesus' name baptism. And on that day, they baptize hundreds of preachers in the name of Jesus Christ. And then they go back, and they teach it to their congregations, and their congregations, entire congregations across the nation of Uganda are baptized that now it is said that somewhere between 400 and 500,000 Ugandans have been baptized in the name of Jesus Christ because a couple ran into a preacher at a Starbucks. We might just have to call it the angel effect because I don't think it's butterfly wings. I think it's angel wings. That if we can get the move of an angel's wings in this place tonight, something can happen that can change your world. Oh, God. Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, don't get so caught up in big things that you fail to do the little things. Little things done today can be the seed for a future harvest. Oh, Lord Jesus. It was a little bit of oil that the widow poured out 
that sustained her family. It was a little cake made for the prophet by a dying woman that sustained them until the rain came. It was a little cloud like a man's hand that ended a three-year drought. It was a little coat that raised a prophet. It was a little space of grace and a little reviving in bondage. The Bible said, despise not the days of small things. Uh, May I tell you that great things start as little things. Moses wasn't always a deliverer. He was a baby in the bulrush. David wasn't always a giant killer. He was once just a shepherd boy. Samuel was an insomniac little boy serving in the temple that became a prophet of God whose words never fell to the ground. May I tell you tonight with all that is within me that your response right now may be the butterfly wings of tomorrow's revival. The little things that we do in the next few minutes, the little things that we do in the next few minutes could be the butterfly wings that start the next revival that sweeps, oh God, oh God, that sweeps throughout this area. What you do right now could be the initial waving, uh, flapping of the wing uh, that starts a revival for your family, for your brothers, your sisters, your nieces, your nephews, your family members right now. What you do right now could be the very impetus for the next great move of the Spirit. You say, well, what, what can I do? You can flap your wings. You say, well, that's not big. Well, a butterfly wings, a butterfly flap is not much. But if you let it go, it could change the world. Don't just walk by that center this week. It could be the flapping of butterfly wings that changes everything. Don't just push off that prompting of the Spirit to pray that comes on you while you're driving down the road doing dishes or rolling over in bed. That, that prompting to pray could be the, the butterfly effect that starts the next great move of the Spirit for your family and changes the dynamic of everything and alters the course. Who would have thought? Who would have thought? Who would have thought that an old blind man by the name of Isaac laying hands on the wrong child could change the course of the Messiah? Who could have thought That old blind man who just laid hands on the wrong son could change the course of history. But we don't talk about Abraham, Isaac, and Esau. We talk about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob because what happened on that day, what happened way back when Esau sold his birthright for a bowl of soup, who would have thought that such a minuscule event would have changed the course of history? But may I tell you tonight that you can sit around and never do anything waiting on the big things to happen, or you can get up right now and you can say, I'm going to start with whatever I can do now. It may just be a hand clap. It may just be an amen. It may be a simple prayer prayed. It may just be inviting one person to church that I've walked by every day for the last 10 years on my job, but that could be, are you listening to me? That very thing could be the butter fly effect. It may be something small that nobody will notice, but by the time it gets down the line, who could imagine what could happen? The butterfly. The butterfly effect. I feel like I, I told Brother Jacob when I, when I came in, I said, man, I, 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 I feel like I got to preach this, but I don't know that I don't know that I'm ready to preach it. I don't know that I don't know that, it's, that, that I'm ready for it. But all I knew was, God, i got to preach this tonight. I don't know. I, I, I'll be honest with you, Brother Barry. I wanted to save it. I wanted to, I, I wanted to save it. I didn't want to preach it tonight. I wanted to preach something else. i got a list of stuff I'm, I've been wanting to preach. And, 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 I, I, and I thought, I don't want to preach this tonight. But I could not get away from it. I just could not get away from it. I've been, I, I, just, I, I, just, I just couldn't get my mind away from it. I couldn't get my heart away from it. I had the message for this morning. I had it done days ago. I, I, was, I, I, was, I had the thought in my mind. I just had to type a few things for it. And I, and, 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 and I thought, but, but tonight's message, I just, in the back of my mind, I kept putting it off. You know, I just didn't want to preach it. I didn't feel like it was, I didn't feel like it was, like, like I was ready to preach it myself. But I could not get away from it. I just felt like God wanted me to preach it tonight. And that makes me think that perhaps somebody in this place is getting ready to start something that you're not even going to hardly remember even doing it, but it's going to change everything for somebody. Oh, God. Oh, Lord. Come on now. Come on. 
I hope we're, it feels like to a certain degree we've been in, 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 in just observation mode today. That you've kind of been watching to see what was going to happen. We hadn't really, we hadn't feel, I don't feel like we've really reached our stride together. I, I don't know why. Maybe it's just me. But I will tell you this much, that if we can get on the same page and understand that we don't have to always be doing great things. We don't have to have have a hundred people in the altar tonight for it to change everything. But it could just be one heart touch that you'll, they'll go home and they'll begin to ponder on the word and they'll begin to sink in and they'll begin to understand, hey, I can do something. I can do something. Let me tell all you young folks something. I'm glad you're up here. Hey, Amen. I'm glad you're up here because now I can preach to you. And you're always up here, and I guess I always preach to you. But let me tell all of you something. You, you may be tempted to think I'm just a young person. This, this, every, this thing is about everybody else. What can I possibly do? What difference can I make? Let me tell you something. The greatest revivals I've ever been in in my life have always been started by young people. That's a fact. Every great revival I've ever been in in my entire life has been started by young people that said, you know what, I can make a difference. I can do something. Don't you sit around and wait till you're 20 or 30 or 40 to do something for God. You do something right now. You may say, well, it's not much. It's not a whole lot. I don't know what I can do that's going to make a difference. You do something little. It can be as small as the flap of a butterfly wing. But by the time God's through with it, you can change your world. I'm telling you, I'm, pre I'm preaching to you right now and those of you that are supposed to be up here. I'm preaching to you right now and letting you know that I believe in you. I believe in your ability to change your world. I don't believe that this generation is going to be lost. I don't believe that this generation is over. If God was done with the church, he'd take us out of here. That means that you have a place. You have a work to do. You have something you can do. So just do it. Just do it. Just do it. Just get busy and say, I can make a difference. I can make a change. It may not be much, but flap your wings, little butterfly. That's all I know how to tell you is just flap your wings and do what you can right now. Just do something. Amen. I've come to tell this church that I believe God let, sent me here tonight to preach this message because there's a revival that he's birthing out of this group here tonight. It may not seem like a lot. It may just be the slight current of butterfly wings. But I will tell you there is a change coming. I said there's a change coming. I said there's a change coming, uh, and that change is going to start tonight. I'd like to get somebody that can believe that you can make a difference. You can make a difference. You can make a difference in your world, uh, but you got to understand, I don't have to be a great thing. I don't have to be a big thing. I don't have to be a major thing. All i got to do is flap my wings like a butterfly, and God can make the ripple effects happen. Stand with me tonight. Stand with me all over this place. Oh, God. Oh, God. It's the butterfly effect available at your local bookseller. The man that came up with this theory was a meteorologist, a scientist that was running statistics on weather patterns. He was entering the numbers into the computer or whatever they were using to compute it up. And he was entering the numbers. And they were carrying it out to the ten thousandths place, decimal place. And in this entire series of data that he was entering, he accidentally rounded off one number wrong. And as the computer models began to show what would happen, just one minute change at a ten thousandths of a decimal point. By the time the model played out and the entire weather system was modeled by the computer, it had turned into a massive storm. It was totally unexpected because none of the data, they, they thought none of the data should end up with that outcome. So they meticulously went through every number. They went through every number. They went through every number. And then he found where he had misrounded off one figure to the ten thousandths of a decimal point. So he changes that figure and he runs the computer model and it comes out with a completely different outcome. 
So he runs it again, and it comes out with the same outcome as the last run. And he does it again several times. So then he goes back again, and he re-enters the misentered number the way he did the first time. And the chaos comes out of it. Because one infinitesimal change changed everything. And he likened it to the flapping of a butterfly wing in one place that starts a hurricane over there. And everybody laughs at him. He's a noted, respected scientist. And they laugh him out of the New York Academy of Science. He's so embarrassed and maltreated that he leaves the entire conference and he goes home and for years he's looked at and thought of as a fool until history plays it out and now there's a law based on his discovery oh you Pentecostals carry on too much Oh, you preachers, you get so carried away. You're just trying to get everybody hyped up and worked up. Oh, you're just trying to get everybody. And, and, and you, look, you can laugh me out of here tonight if you want to. But all it takes is one person that gets a hold of what I'm preaching tonight and gets something, no matter how minute, started in motion. Oh, God. Oh, what would happen with just a small change today could change our world tomorrow? Is there any room for a small change in your life? Is there any room tonight for a small change in your habits, a small change in your prayer life? Is there any room tonight for a small change in your worship habits? Because I'll submit to you that if there's enough room for a small change, it's enough room to eventually change your world. Oh, God. Lord, I feel the draw of your spirit tonight. God, I hope that I've done what you've asked me to do. I hope, God, that you helped me tonight. I hope that you've helped, you've helped me to touch somebody's heart. God, that somewhere under the sound of my voice, there is somebody who instead of waiting for some big, life-changing event to turn their spiritual world around, that, God, they would start, even if it's as minute as the flap of a butterfly, could very well be the spark that changes everything. Eyes are closed, heads are bowed all over this place. If you feel like you've been preached to tonight, you feel like the Lord has talked to you, I just want you to step out and come and find a place to pray. If you feel like the Lord has ministered to you something, even as something infinitesimal that maybe nobody else could even perceive. But you know that God's dealt with you about it.